Well, guys, we've been in the study of the book of Mark, and Mark, the writer, tells us straight up the very first line of his story about the life of Jesus tells us who Mark believed Jesus was, that he was the promised one. He was the fulfillment of the Jewish scriptures. What the prophets had spoken of, the promised king who would come. And then he goes about in the first half of his gospel to tell us who Jesus was through his actions as well as his words. And then at the halfway point, it comes to the culmination when Jesus asks his followers, who am I? Not who do people say I am, but who am I to you? Because we need to know that the foundation of our faith is our personal acknowledgement of who Jesus is to us. And so when Peter says, you are the Messiah, the Son of God, he said, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, Peter, but my Father in heaven. And then he goes on to tell them what it means to be the Messiah and how he would be king, even though their minds have trouble wrapping around it. In the second half of Mark's story, he lets us know how Jesus becomes king, how he was crowned the king of kings, because it was not in a way that anybody would think. Because truly Jesus had come as the promised king. But in God's kingdom, this upside down reality, that God's ways are so different than what we would think or what we would know or acknowledge. Because see, when you talk about a coronation, a coronation is when a king is crowned. It's when they take the oath. It's when they're anointed. And when they, that sovereign takes their throne to rule over their kingdom. When we think about it as humans, we think about it in, in pomp and in regalia and in royal authority that's shown. We think of all of these things. But again, in God's kingdom, it's so different than what we anticipate or expect. So today's message, I've called it this. The king's coronation. How Jesus became king. Because you and I need to understand the true power is not in just the ability to act, but in, in the ability not to act even when you have it at your disposal to be able to do so. The ability to restrain is one of the greatest efforts of strength and power. And Jesus His rule was so different, so contrary to what our minds would think. See, when we want a champion, we want someone to come, be honest with me, we think of somebody that comes to fight our battles on our behalf. We have in our mind, whatever whatever you look at as a hero, you know, when I was growing up, whether it's a Bruce Lee type, whether it's one of my favorite movies, you want Maximus, a gladiator, that you don't come to rent, or whether it's just a John Wick type. You want somebody, you want, you want like a Liam Neeson to be the one in Taken. You want God as a king to come and get you back from being taken by an enemy. That's, that's what you think. But you see, Jesus came in a kingdom that showed a separate and different value system. In the kingdom of God, Jesus taught us that the last would be first. That the greatest would be the servant of all. And so in essence, when we think of a kingdom, we think that's, that it's the, the citizens and the soldiers who fight and, die and are willing to die for their king. But in God's kingdom, Jesus the king was the one willing to come and fight and die on our behalf and not just for us, but even for his enemies. You see, everything in the kingdom of God is so radically different because why? Jesus came preaching the message of the kingdom. In fact, the very first message he ever declared, he came telling everyone that the kingdom of God was coming. That God was coming to regain his authority, to regain all the, 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 the reign of him over all creation, to restore all things. And then he said something that was so outrageous to the minds of those that heard it. He said, he is doing it all through me. I'm the one who's come as king. To reign over the kingdom. See, Isaiah had said that God himself would come. The promises of the Old Testament prophets said that God himself would come. That God would be our savior. That God would be the one who would rule and reign over all this. But yet we see Jesus. Because Jesus was the one who had come to bring it. And so when Jesus came riding into Jerusalem, anybody who ever thought that Jesus never declared himself to be the Messiah... It's just ignorant. Because when Jesus came to Jerusalem, the prophet Zechariah said that behold, 
Your king, O Jerusalem, your king, O Israel, will come to you meek and humble, riding on the fowl of a colt. And Jesus came triumphantly into Jerusalem. And immediately he confronted the, the, the corrupt and violent powers in the power of God's generous love. See, Jesus willingly gave himself over to them. Now, never miss this point. Jesus was in full and total control. Jesus said, no one takes my life from me. I lay my life down, and I will take my life up again. So Jesus allowed them to arrest him. He allowed them to condemn him to die. He allowed them to mock him and ultimately crucify him and enthrone him as king over God's new world order. See, all of it was not in a way that we would anticipate or have expected. But you see, Jesus came to declare the power of the kingdom of God is shown in, in the willingness to love and through self-sacrifice is how Jesus would defeat death he would defeat hell. He would defeat sin and all that Satan brought to humankind. You see, when Jesus was being tried, when Jesus was being before those, he was in perfect and total royal authority. Do not miss this, Anne. Because even when Jesus was before his detractors, he never felt the necessity to defend himself. Jesus remained silent because he had nothing to defend. I don't know, know about you. When people are lying about you, when people are misrepresenting you, how do you respond? The most natural response we have, I don't know about you, I go like, wait a minute, that's a lie. That's not true. Don't we generally tend to defend ourselves? But Jesus in full control allowed what happened to happen because he came to fulfill all that had been promised. In fact, even before Pilate, because Pilate became scared and asked Jesus, are you the king? And Jesus said, is this your thought or were you told this? He said, I am the king. And he said this, Pilate, in asking Jesus about it, he said, do you not recognize, do you not realize that I have the authority to either free you or condemn you to die? And Jesus looked at him so calmly and said, you would have no authority unless it was given to you from on high. So come on, make my day. See, Jesus was in full control because why? He knew that to free us, to liberate us from the power of sin and death would require him to lay down his life for us. And that's why it's important to recognize this. This is the thought I want us to grapple with today. Our true freedom and security is found under the covering of the king. Our true freedom and security is found under the covering of the king. You see, who the king is and what he did for us should compel all of us to embrace him as our king. But God gives the dignity of every human being. You see, the good news, the gospel, it's a royal proclamation. Jesus is king. But gives the ability of human beings to bow or bolt. The choice is ours. And you see, to understand how Jesus ultimately brought victory for us, how he freed us from our true enemy, from Satan, from sin, and from all the power of death that he held over humankind, it's important to recognize that the Bible is one unified story that leads us to Jesus. John the Baptist, who is the forerunner, the one that Isaiah prophesied would come, making way for the Lord. That the promises of old were now coming to pass. And John, when Jesus was baptized, looked at Jesus, pointed to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. See, I need to help you to understand the last week of Jesus' life is to know a little bit about the history in the Bible. Because when God had chosen Abraham and said that through you, through your family, all the nations of the world would be blessed. That the freedom that I've been promising Abraham, you, your family, is going to bring about the one that had been promised. And now, 
when, God, when Abraham, when his family was in captivity in, in Egypt under the slavery of a man named Pharaoh, under the cruelty of the Egyptian people who persecuted and enslaved the nation of Israel and made them basically less than. Their cries went up to their God. And God raised up Moses and said, Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. But Pharaoh's heart was stubborn. Pharaoh's heart said no. And Pharaoh, God begins to act in power. God begins to show that he's the one true God. He judges all the gods of Egypt. But ultimately, what brought deliverance? What brought freedom for the people of Israel? God gave these instructions to Moses. And he said this, it's found in Exodus 12. He said, tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. These instructions that Moses gave the people was to find a lamb that they were to examine. One without spot nor blemish. One that was, in essence, perfect for a sacrifice. The best that they had. And then word of what? Then take care of them for four days. Because he says this, take care of it until the 14th day of the month. Then all of the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. And then what? And then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of their houses where they eat the lamb. So here was the instructions. Find a lamb that was spotless, take care of it, kill it on the 14th day, take some of its blood, put it on the door frames of your home, and then gather inside and eat. Why? Because look at verse 13, what God said. The blood will be a sign for you on the, on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. In other words, what was it that protected the people? What was it that gave them their freedom? What separated them from all that was going on in Egypt? Was it their nationality? Was it because they're Jewish that they were saved? No, not according to the scripture here, right? Was it because they had a covenant with God from Abraham that they were saved? Was that in it alone? No. What was it that did? They had to obey. They had to trust that God would deliver them through the blood of the Lamb. They had to respond. They had to act. They had to think. Their minds could say, oh, this doesn't make any sense. But guess what? If they did not act in accordance to what God said, then they would not experience the freedom. They would not experience the deliverance that God had for them. In other words, they had to act in faith. They had to trust that what God said he would do. Now this was the most sacred ceremony that the Israelites then enacted. The, the feast of the Passover. You see, that's where we get the name from. God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. The judgment that's coming on the world because of sin and unrighteousness, you, my friends, are protected and covered by the blood of the Lamb. So in essence, Jesus, to understand the last week of his life, Jesus enters Jerusalem during the Passover. In fact, at the beginning of the Passover festival. The day in which Jesus, what we celebrate today as Palm Sunday, the day that Jesus comes into Jerusalem is the 10th day of the month. The day in which they were to declare and select a lamb for themselves. And then what happens to Jesus immediately? The chief priests and the elders begin to examine him. They begin to ask him. When you read the Gospels, what you discover is they're sending party after party to go to Jesus with questions. They're attempting to trap him. They're attempting to find a way to find fault in him. But every time that they try to trap Jesus, their trap falls on themselves. Because Jesus confounds them with, their, with his answers. Jesus is spotless. There is no means of accusation against him. So finally, when their plots don't work as they expect, they hatch another plot where they get one of Jesus' disciples to betray him. And they figure out a time at night when they can go and arrest him. 
And so they show up, arrest Jesus, and where do they take them? Look at this in Mark chapter 14. It says, they took Jesus to the high priest. And to all the chief priests and elders and the teachers of the law, they all came together. And why? Look at verse 55. The chief priests and all the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But notice this next phrase. But they did not find any. Why? Because there was none to be found. Think about if someone to go through your life, if someone were to get a big enough magnifying glass where they could look at every little aspect of it, your search history on your computer, your ways in which you fill out your taxes, all of the different things. If God were to look at everything in a microscope about your life, would he find aspects of accusation? Yes, because we've all sinned and fallen short. But when Jesus was put under the microscope, he was spotless, sinless. There was no evidence in any way. And then what? They paid to have these witnesses come, concoct stories about him. But even their own testimonies don't, collab don't collaborate the story. And so what? Jesus sits there. The high priest stood before him and asked Jesus, are you not going to answer? You see, when people are lying about you, when people are misrepresenting you, again, our basic instinct is to defend ourselves, to say something. But Jesus is in full and complete control. Doesn't even answer. And so what happens? He said, these men are bringing it against you. He's like, but what happens? Look at verse 61. But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. So ultimately, the high priest became frustrated and said, again, the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah the son of the blessed one? See, Jesus, in this moment, the high priest was like going into a court. It was like before a judge. He's under oath. He asked to tell, and the, the high priest, what does he ask him? Are you the Messiah? Are you the son of the blessed one? Well, isn't that who Jesus is? And so Jesus is asked the simple question, who are you? And Jesus boldly answers, look what he says. I am, in fact, that's the most sacred name of God. That's the term Yahweh. He said, I am the one that had been promised. I am what you are asking me. I'm the one who had come in fulfillment of all that the ancient prophets had spoken. I am. And then he says this. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. That is a direct reference to Daniel 7, which is one of the most beloved messianic prophecies. That Jesus was coming to be the king who would reign forever over all of the nations of the world. That's exactly what he makes reference to. But how did they respond? The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. See, to the Jewish mind, blasphemy was a horrible sin. It was what? A human being claiming that he was equal to God. In other words, the way to defile God. You're trying to bring God down on your level without realizing the God of his own will, the God of his own accord, had taken him on the body of a human and come down for us to ultimately be the sacrifice that we all needed. But they declared that he had spoken blasphemy. He said, what do you think? And they all condemned him worthy of death. So they condemn Jesus, and then they take him to Pilate. Why? Because the Jewish authorities did not have the authority. They did not have the right to execute somebody. That required Roman authority. Why? Because they were under Roman occupation. They were a part of the Roman Empire. And so it required the governor to make an edict if Jesus was to be put to death. So they take him to Pilate. And this is the height of religious hypocrisy because they bring Pilate, Jesus to Pilate, but they won't go into Pilate's palace because they want to be ceremonially clean to be able to eat the Passover. Although they're condemning an innocent man to death, they're worried about being unclean. But Pilate comes down to them, and here it's so amazing, the, the chief priests and elders make all of these accusations against Jesus. And Pilate looks over at Jesus, and he's silent. And the Bible says that Pilate marveled. 
It always caught my attention. How many people had this man in his tenure as a governor had overseen that many trials that Jesus stood alone because probably every human that was ever brought before him, if their life was at stake, they would plead for their life. They would do anything that they could to find freedom. But yet, here was Jesus allowing all of his enemies to defile him, to degrade him, to lie and pervert. And Pilate knew that they were for envy and self-interest to turn Jesus over to him. Pilate pulls Jesus aside. He examines him. He finds nothing in Jesus worthy of death. Comes back to the high priest. And they're like, you're no friend of Caesar. He claims to be a king. Pilate goes back and says, are you a king? That's when Jesus said, well, who told you this? Is this your own? And, and Pilate says, do you not realize who I am? I could just see Jesus looking at him. Do you not realize who I am? And so Pilate tries to find a way out, tries to wash his hands of the incident. He takes Jesus before the crowd and he says, what shall I do with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them and look at what happened. Crucify him, they shouted. Just remember, five days ago when they came into the city of Jerusalem, what did they shout? Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And now, which is, listen to me. How many times in our life have we vowed that we're going to be loyal, we're going to do God, do your will, and we find ourselves under pressure, abdicating, giving up, and going a different way? But you need to realize this, that it was for us that he died. Even those crowds that called for his death, it was for them that he was willing to take it. So they cowed, they shouted, crowds, crucify him. And Pilate asked, why? What crime has he committed? But do you ever notice when people get into a mob mentality, there's never any rationale, there's never any reasoning behind it. It's just violence, it's just anarchy, it's just chaos. And so what? They shout all the louder, crucify him. And then notice this, wanting to satisfy the crowd. It shows up. Pilate for who he is. He wasn't a leader. You see, someone who's given the responsibility of leadership does what's right because it's right, even when it's hard. When you're attempting to try to please other people, when you're attempting to appease others, at that moment, you are not leading. You are a coward, and you are cowering to pressure. And in essence, Pilate gives in to the crowd, tries to wash his hands of it, and what does he do? Pilate releases Barabbas to them, and he has Jesus flogged and handed over to be crucified. Remember, he said, I didn't find anything in him worthy of death. But yet he oversees his crucifixion anyway. But you see, all of this was what foretold. Because why? He would be pierced for our transgressions. He would be bruised for our iniquities. The punishment to bring peace between God and man would be on him. And alone through his stripes could we find healing and wholeness. And so Jesus is led out to be crucified. And in the ninth, in, at nine in the morning, when they crucified him, this is what Pilate had written. Written notice of his charge against him. This is what was affixed to his cross, the king of the Jews. See, Jesus was enthroned king. They gave him a crown of thorns. And they enthroned him on a cross. Because why? Because he was the king who came to bring true liberation and freedom for you and me. Because when he was dying on the cross, he was taking the place for the consequences of human rebellion against God. He gave his life in exchange for the sin and the rebellion of all humankind. Jesus knew what was necessary. And see, Jesus was revealing that day that the kingdom of God is released through love and self-sacrifice. Jesus said of himself, he said, unless a seed fall into the ground and die, it remains alone. But if it dies, it releases what's in it 
and multiplies and brings forth life. You see, Jesus was not just a human. But as God Almighty, the blood that flowed in his veins was divine. And when he gave his life, he brought freedom. He brought liberation. He brought forgiveness. He brought release. He brought for us all that we needed. How did he defeat our enemy? By allowing the power of love to prove stronger than hate and evil and even death itself. How do we find freedom? How do we find deliverance? The same way that the people of Israel that were in the land of Egypt is when we look at him and realize that it was the Lamb of God that took on himself our sins, our iniquities, all that stood between us and Almighty God and gave his life in exchange for us. That when we see him and like the Israelites in faith, apply his blood to the door of our heart, then we find freedom because why? Death, hell, and the grave pass over. We are liberated by the blood of the Lamb. You see, God's victory came about in this way. In fact, that's what John the Apostle saw in a vision. Because in heaven, in Revelation 5, in heaven it says, God spoke and said, who is worthy to open this, 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 uh, uh, um, this document that's sealed with seven seals? Who is, who is worthy to open the scroll and loose the seals? And people began to weep because nobody was coming forward. And John begins to get caught up in the emotion of it. And look what happens. Revelation 5, 5, it says, And then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Now notice how he describes See the lion of the tribe of Judah. See, we want the king of the beast. We want the one we think is going to bring victory the way we see it. He says, what? The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And look what John saw. And then I saw what? A lamb looking as if it had been slain. Standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. And the Lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. You and I need to recognize at the center of all authority, at the very throne of Almighty God, is a Lamb as if it had been slain. Because the way in which God brought deliverance for humanity was not the way we anticipated. It wasn't with all of the violence and evil that the world knows. No, it was in love that he gave himself for us. And through his death, he brought freedom and deliverance. Because his life, given in exchange for our life, means that his blood is able to free us from all of the sin and guilt and shame and condemnation that the enemy has ever used to enslave you. No, we need to see our king. Look at three things as we close today. Look at our king. When you look at Jesus, Jesus' sinless life was the sacrifice necessary to liberate us from sin and death. Why? Because, see, the life of the flesh is in the blood, the Scripture says. Jesus gave his life. See, he lived the life that we should have lived and died the death we should have died. And he gave to us a gift, something that we did not deserve. His righteous life was given on our behalf. And that's why scripture says, when you and I begin to embrace this, this is where we experience the freedom that comes through this. Because why? The Bible says, he who knew no sin was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. When you begin to realize that it's not what I do, but what he did, it frees you from religion. It stops you from trying to prove that you're a good person, that you can save yourself in some way. No, when you embrace the sinless, spotless son of God, to know that they that receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life through one 
Jesus Christ, you begin to realize that we don't fight for victory, we fight from victory. We don't fight for freedom, we fight from freedom. Because whom the Son has set free is free indeed. But secondly, just as importantly, it's one thing to be set free, it's another thing to remain free. Our King, we live free, we remain free through faith in the blood of of the Lamb. You and I need to recognize this. Right now in today's times, it ain't talked a whole lot about. In fact, in the 20th century, people try to say, oh, blood, that's, that's so ancient, that's so archaic, that's so misdated. No, 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 it's about being a good person. No, you need to understand something. What Jesus accomplished on our behalf, his blood, the Bible tells us, speaks. Hebrews 12 says the blood of Jesus speaks better things than the blood of Abel. You and I need to learn to tune in and start listening to what the blood is saying. And stop listening to the lies, perversions, and ways of the wicked one. Because when you begin to listen to the power of the blood, you realize that the blood tells you that you are redeemed. Redeemed means to buy back. In fact, human worth was only valued one time when it was placed on a scale to determine what it was worth. And you won't find it anywhere else but to look at the cross because it blows the human mind. Worth is what somebody is willing to pay on their behalf. In fact, when someone's held for ransom, what are you willing to give to get them back? When you begin to recognize that Jesus gave his life as a ransom for us, it's the blood of Jesus that begins to, to tell you so loudly, so clearly who you are. Why allow the voices of the world to tell you you're less when the blood is telling you that you are more precious, more valuable than you have ever even begun to imagine? In fact, the blood, it reconciles us to God. What does the word reconcile mean? It's an accounting term. What you and I need to recognize is this, that the debt has been paid. When you begin to recognize the power of the blood, the debt's paid once and for all. Then you stop allowing shame or guilt or condemnation to make you run from God. No, you need to realize the blood of Jesus is an ever-present reality that tells you that even when you sin, don't run from God, run to him because why? The blood blood has already paid the price. The more you begin to recognize that, the less control the enemy has over you. In fact, the Bible tells us that through the blood of Jesus, we are cleansed. In other words, there's no record. It is removed. All of the stain, all of the shame, all of the condemnation has been taken away when you understand the power of the blood. In fact, the Bible tells us through the blood of Jesus, we can enter boldly into the throne room of grace. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 9, it says, If the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean thing sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Jesus, shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Rather, purge your consciousness of dead works to serve the living God. See, the blood has been telling you, you need to stop carrying around all of the baggage that you carry from a relationship to a relationship. All of the baggage that tells you that you're not, that you're, that you're less than. Stop carrying the baggage of the comments of others that you've held, carrying around like a ball and chain on your leg. No, the power of the blood of Jesus Christ declares today that you are free, that you can walk in liberty because why the blood testifies that you are free. And when you would begin to understand that, you realize what? That you overcome him by the blood of the lamb and the, and the word of your testimony. That's why Satan doesn't want this message to be known. That's why the enemy doesn't want you to realize what the blood is speaking to you. But when you begin to listen, when you begin to trust, when you begin to recognize what your king did on your behalf and what his blood bought for you, Satan's days of controlling you through fear and guilt and shame are over. You and I are free because whom the Son has set free is free indeed. 
So let me finish with this. Our king, following our king is to trust that love is the most powerful force in the kingdom. Following Jesus means believing and understanding that his way is the way in which we adopt and learn to live by. Because our king is a slain lamb. What the world counts as weakness, God says no. Humility is power. You don't have to take matters into your own hands. Trust me. Follow me. Do things my way. It begins to realize that following my king is realizing that the ways of the kingdom are what I put my trust in. That I leave aside all the ways of trying to defend myself, trying to act in ways that we think that this is what I need to do. No, 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 no. Follow him. Trust him. And as a follower of Jesus, begin to make known this good, this euangelion, this good news to all men. Guys, next week is Easter. There are people in your world that need to hear what Christ has already done. We're not waiting for heaven to do something. Heaven has done it. We have a message of good news. We have a message of freedom. Who in your world do you need to have the boldness to begin to say, you know what, I'm going to go out of my way. I'm going to bring somebody here. Because to follow Jesus is to realize that the slain lamb is the good news for all mankind. Because when I have the courage to trust and believe that what God did on my behalf, I stopped trying to do things in my own power which were futile anyway, and trust in the one who gave himself for me. That's good news. That's what our king did. That's why at the center of the throne of God is a lamb as if it had been slain.